Well, good morning, church. We are so glad that you are tuning in to watch and to worship with us here this morning. If you happen to be a viewer, if this is your first time to join us, whether you're watching here live on YouTube or Facebook, or maybe you're catching the recording sometime later, we're glad that you have chose to uh, come and join us virtually in our time of worship to, to hear this message. I believe that God has purposefully brought you to hear this message today because he has something from his word that he wants to say to you this morning. Hey, as David mentioned, we did a little uh, drive-by wishes for Kevin yesterday. And then, of course, uh, all of our elders and I was great to see. We had over 50 people come and just to see you and pray over you and pray with you and enjoy some fellowship time together. But I want you to know that there was something that happened yesterday that has encouraged me more than anything else so far during the time of shelter in place. And that's that I saw three to four guys that had some full beards growing. That's awesome. Keep up the great work, guys. We're in a series of messages for the month of May that I'm calling Shelter in Grace. We began on the first Sunday of May by looking at this idea that during this time of shelter in place, we need God's grace more than ever before. And we need to be a people who say, Lord, shelter in your grace and how bet, how much we need God's grace in our life. Uh, we looked in our first lesson that grace is a gift from God. It's received by faith. It's available to anyone. It comes through Christ and it is something that is extended throughout eternity. Last week we spent some time looking at Psalm 91 with the promise that whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High, will find rest in God. And what it means to shelter under God's wing of grace and how God's sheltering grace is a refuge for us in times of temptation, in times of troubles, and in times of trials. All of these messages, if you have not heard them yet, they're all available for online demand on YouTube. You can watch them right there. But today, we're going to look at the third message in this series. And I've entitled today's sermon, Standing in God's Grace. And I called that from a passage in Romans. In fact, the first scripture on your outline this morning comes from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And I want you to listen just these two verses. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. I really want you to notice that part of the verse where it says, this grace in which we now stand. I, I love the imagery. I, I love the idea of standing in God's grace. You know, we think of stand as in stand firm and stand secure. And it's only through God's grace that we do have that ability to stand strong and to stand firm because of what Jesus did for us. But I also like the idea of standing in the grace of God, like standing out in the rain. If you've ever been caught out in a pouring rain and you just get soaked, you get drenched. I mean, my grandmother, when I would be a young child playing outside, she'd say, Chatty, get in, you're getting soaked to the bone. And I love that idea of soaked to the bone, just totally drenched with God's grace, a grace in which we stand. So I put an outline online, and on your outline today, there's just uh, four blanks. They all start with the letter A, and I want to look at four ways with you this morning on how we can stand in God's grace. Number one on your outline, the first A is this, I need to ask God for help and humility. That's where it begins. It starts off with asking God for his grace in our life. It starts off by understanding that I can't do it on my own. 
I can't get through this by myself. And any time that we think we are self-sufficient, that we can just do this on our own, what we do is that we short-circuit God's grace in our life. God's power doesn't have the ability to work in our life the way God wants it to work in our life because we have this pride build up that we just think, well, I, I should be able to do this. I should be able to handle this. And what we need to do is to cry out for help to God. When we're facing tough times, especially during the time and the season where we are in right now, it's a time that we ask God for help. We need to ask God to give us his grace, to let us experience his mercy and his power in our lives. Admit that we cannot do this on our own. Look at the promise of Jesus. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will open to you. So it begins by asking God. We have to ask God. Now, the Bible teaches that humility is a pathway to God's grace. That one of the ways that we receive the grace of God in our lives is when we learn to approach God with humility. Because the Bible promises that if we don't humble ourselves before God, he will be the one who humbles us. Now, I put James chapter 4, verse 6 on your outline. It's here on the screen, but the Bible says that God gives us even more grace. Now, what the scriptures teach is this. Listen, he said, the scriptures say, God is against the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, when James, the brother of Jesus, wrote that, when he said the scriptures say, well, I looked back because when he would have said the scriptures, well, he would have been talking about the Old Testament. And in Proverbs 3, this isn't on your outline. I didn't put it on the screen. But Proverbs 3, verse 34 says, God gives grace to the humble. Humility is the pathway to grace. And we should ask God to help us to be humble humility as meekness, as lowliness, as the absence of self. Translated humility or humble, a lowliness of mind. So the humility that we need to receive God's grace, it's an attitude of the heart. It's a state of mind, not just an outward demeanor. So we need to lose our pride, surrender our self-sufficient attitudes, and humbly ask God for his grace, a grace in which we can stand. Number two on your outline is this. If I'm going to stand in God's grace, I need to apply God's word to my life. I need to apply God's word to my life. You know, many of us have more time now, uh, whether it's our job from working at home gives us more time, whether our hours have been cut back, or for some of you, I know you experience a, a time of not being able to work. But I hope that in this extra time, you're finding more time to spend with God and allow him to speak to you through his word. And more than just him to speak from his word, but to take what I hear and what I read and what I learn from God's word and actually apply it in my life. Because that is a pathway. Once I humble myself and I ask for grace, I start to use God's word to let me experience his grace. So Psalm 119 verse 25, the Psalm writer says that I lie in the dust. So revive me by your word. I want you to notice that when David or, or whoever happened to be the writer of this Psalm said that he was down, that he was lowly, that he was depressed, that he was discouraged. It says he was just lying in the dust. What did he use to revive him? It doesn't say TV. It doesn't say Netflix or Facebook or, or TikTok or anything else. It was God's word where he found the strength to be revived. It was God's word being applied to his life where grace was received. Psalm 19, verse 7, God's word is perfect in every way. It revives our souls. The word of God is perfect. And perfect in what ways? 
every ways, the text says. God's word is perfect in every way. It revives our soul. It doesn't change. Unlike today's world, where we have all these experts who get on TV and they say this about the COVID virus, or they, or they say we should wear a mask, or we shouldn't wear a mask, or you should choose to or not to wear a mask, and things that change so much and so often, but God's word never changes. It is perfect in every way, and it revives us. It'll help us to experience God's grace and to understand what God says we need to do to live out the life that he's called us to live. I love Hebrews 4.12. There the Bible says that God's word is living and it is active. God's word is living and active active. So I want you to see that word living. In fact, you might want to go ahead and circle where it says God's word is living. The description of God's word, the description of the Bible as living means that it has this vital power that is inherent in and of itself. God's word is, is alive. It's active. It's powerful. God's word is, I love what Paul told Timothy, that all scripture is God breathed. It is the breath of God. It is God speaking to us. The word of God accomplishes his purposes. The preaching of God's word brings about God's desired effects. Reading it, applying it, and obeying God's word will transform your life. The Bible is unlike any other book in that it brings about lasting supernatural change within a person. I didn't put these next two scriptures on the screen or on your outline, but Romans 10, verse 17, Paul says, Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. And then our faith, that's our faith comes from the message, from the word of God. And the way we demonstrate our faith is by what we do. In James chapter 2, uh, James talking about the faith of Abraham, he says, you see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. Man, if I want to experience and I want to stand, just be saturated in God's sustaining grace in my life, God's sheltering grace in my life, I need to apply God's word. To my life. Let me give you a third one. Number three is this. I need to learn to accept support from God's people. I need to learn to accept support from God's people. This is so important. I mean, you know what? Do you know what one of the hardest things about social distancing is? The hardest thing about social distancing is social distancing. I mean, it's, it's having to be apart. It's not being able to be together with people we want to be with, with family and with friends and with church family, that we want to enjoy fellowship, that we want to be able to commune together, that we want to be able to pray and to lay hands on and to hug and to embrace. We need each other. God created us for community. We are meant to be social beings. So when we're told that we have to social distance, it's no wonder we're experiencing so many trials and troubles and heartaches and pains because we're just not created to be like that. But even during this time of social distancing, we still need to be there for one another as a church. And we need to be willing when we're facing a hard time, I don't if it's job loss or a marriage problem or, or whatever, a sickness, you need to reach out and accept the help of your church family. The Bible says this, Galatians 6, verse 2, Share each other's troubles and problems, and so obey the Lord's command. I mean, God commands us to bear our burdens. God commands us to share our troubles and our problems. And he also tells us that when we rejoice, we should rejoice with each other as well. 
And when you're going through hard times, especially now during this, this time of shelter in place, you need your church family more than ever. And I know that we cannot be the family that we want to be at this time because we have to be separated. But social distance doesn't separate us from encouraging and supporting one another. That's still our call. That's still our duty. And I just, church, listen, I do not understand people who do not reach out to their brothers and sisters in Christ when they're going through a hard time. And then often we find out about someone in our church family who's going through a divorce, who's going through a sickness, who's going through a financial hardship, days, weeks, months, some years after it's been going on. And we think, man, why didn't you tell us? Why didn't you let us pray with you? Why didn't you let us reach out to you before? Because often by the time we find out, it's as if they're off the deep end. And God says that he gave us to each other so that we can encourage and we can help one another. The Bible says, Philippians 2, 4, each other's best interest, not just your own. I, I, and that's, that's so natural for us to want to invest in and look after our own interests. The Bible says that we're to care for and to care about one another. This is why small groups are so important. This is why you have got to be involved in a small group because I really believe we, we don't know when we're going to get back together and what that's going to look like. But small groups are going to be essential as we are striving to build the community and to experience the grace and to accept support from God's people. And if you want to experience God's grace, if you want to stand in the sheltering grace of God, you need to accept the support of God's people because often God extends his grace through us, through other people. And that's so essential that we have that in our life. Let me give you one more. Ask God for help and humility. Apply God's word. Accept support of God's people. And the number four, acclaim God's promises. Acclaim God's promises. I, I use that word. It's kind of a weird word. We don't use it a lot. But I used acclaim just because I wanted all of my points to start with the same letter today. <laughs> but I looked up acclaim, and the word acclaim as a verb just means to praise enthusiastically and publicly. And of course, as a noun, it just means enthusiastic and public praise. I mean, we're just called, when we think about who God is and what God has done for us in the past, and we understand that same God is here to do for us what he did in the past for us now, and what he's going to do for us throughout eternity, that gives us reason to want to give praise to him. And when we start to, to just exclaim and to acclaim and to publicly praise who and what God is in our life, we'll start to experience God's grace more and more. We ask God for help and humility. We apply his word into our life. We accept the support of God's people in our lives. And then we begin to experience these promises. Promises like this. Isaiah 40, verses 29 through 31 on your outline. He, God, gives strength to the weary, and he increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Man, that is something that we should praise with enthusiasm and in public. Amen. I mean, that is just, that is a promise of God. How do you keep on going? How do you handle this time of social distancing and this time of shelter in place? And I'm worried about sickness and I'm worried about family and I'm worried about jobs and I'm worried about my marriage and I'm worried about my kids. And it's, how do I get through this? I get through this by acclaiming the promises that God has made to me, by, by knowing that it's only because uh, of coming to him in humility and asking him for his grace, that it's only by a applying his word in my life and accepting the love and support of my brothers and sisters in Christ that I am able to get through the things that life can throw at me. We acclaim God's promises. It's in him that we've put our hope and it's in him that we stand in his grace. You know, I have read 
the estimates, uh, some scholars have said that there are up to 7,000 different promises contained within the pages of Scripture. Almost all scholars agree there's over 3,000. So somewhere between 3,000 to 7,000 thousand promises are found in the pages of scripture that's a lot of promises and God is a God who when he makes a promise he keeps his word every time God promises to bless us and to lead us and to guide us and to shield us to defend us and to shelter us to sustain us and to help us that he forgives us and he saves us the Bible promises that if we search for him we will find him. When we pray to him, he listens. When we ask, he answers. When we knock, he opens the door. The Bible promises that all things work for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. He promises that he will always be with us and that he will never leave us. Did you know that in his word, he promises that he will supply all all of your needs, all of them. It's in there. Look it up. God will supply not all my wants, but all my needs. Where are you going to find that promise? Nowhere. Acclaim the promises of God in your life. I like this last scripture on your outline. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all of God's promises... Christ with a resounding yes. Christ, our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. How many of God's promises? All of them. How many are there? More than 3,000. And all of those promises have been fulfilled. How have they been fulfilled? In Christ. They have been fulfilled in Jesus. We can stand in God's grace because of Jesus. Now the promise of Jesus is come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and I am humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's in Jesus experience the promises of all the promises of God are fulfilled. And Jesus is light. He is the only way. He is the only truth. He is the only life. There is no other way to the Father except through him. For salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given by men by which we must be saved. All of God's promises are fulfilled in him. And to that we say, Amen. If, if I want to shelter in God's grace, if I am going to stand and be saturated in the amazing grace of God, I need to ask God for his help, to ask him for his grace in my life, and to ask him to give me humility, to be willing to know that I can't do it on my own, that I need the support of others, that I need to spend time in God's word, apply it to my life so that the way that I behave lines up with what I say I believe. I need to, to acclaim these promises that come from God. And then I can stand in his sheltering grace. L listen one more time. Just listen again to Romans 5 verses 1 through 2 that was the first scripture on your outline. Hear it again. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith to this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That is good news. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father God, I ask a blessing upon everyone hearing this right now. I pray, Lord, that they would find shelter in your grace during this time that we are in. Lord, there are so many that are going through so many things in addition to the shelter in place and the social distancing that we're dealing with. And I just pray, Lord, 
that in a very new and very real and very powerful way, your spirit would speak to the person today, the person here. that you would humble them so we can experience your grace. Help us to spend more time reading and applying your word to our life in all that we do. I am so thankful for this church and this church family and how even though we can't be together and we have to be separated, that we're not isolated, that we are still there to, to just support one another. And I pray that people would accept the support from your church. And Lord, I just am so thankful for the many promises of Scripture. I claim and I acclaim them as true today, and I pray that my life is indicative to the fact that I believe in you, the true and the living God. Help us to be the people you're calling us to be. Help us to experience what it means to stand in your sheltering grace. This we pray in Jesus' name, and all who agree say, Amen.